الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to grant us the faith and success and that he makes the people of good manners in the dunya so we can be of those people who attain that reward in the akhirah. This is the third session uh, from the very important book written by Al-Allama Abu Wafa uh, Ibn Aqil Al-Hambali Rahimahullah which he entitled Fusul Al-Adab wa Makarim Al-Akhlaq al Mashru'ah. Uh, chapters in character and noble manners which have been legislated in our religion. Uh, in the last session we looked at some of the rulings concerning greetings and how we should speak and address one another. In today's session, inshallah, we're going to be looking at brotherhood and some of the aspects of character and manners and etiquettes that we should have towards one another as brothers and sisters in Islam. And inshallah, if there's time, we will also look at what the author says towards uh, the chapters after that when he talks about hygiene and fitra and appearance and hairstyles and things like that. Now, this word, brotherhood, my brother and my sister, uh, it's become very easy on the tongue of most people. Uh, the question is, how would you treat somebody that you shared a womb with at one point in your life, whether you were twins or whether somebody's older, somebody's younger? How would you treat that person? What kind of relationship would you want to have with that person? That is precisely what Islam tells us to have with our brothers and sisters in Islam. Not that the word becomes cheap, that you don't have any manners towards him. Allah says in the Quran, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْدُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْدُ The believing male and the believing females, they are allies to one another. Shaykh bin Baz, rahimahullah, meaning that they complete one another. They cooperate with one another. They learn with one another. They aid each other in taqwa. They enjoin what is good to one another and they advise and they try and stop bad from one another. Whether it's part of their character, whether it's part of the actions, whether it's something uh, you know, of spiritual badness and goodness, they are aware of the needs and what is good for their brother and their sister. And included in that, is praising them, and included in that is taking uh, their word seriously, included in that is thinking highly of them, included in that is covering their mistakes. And when a person understands the concept of brotherhood in Islam, which we don't have time to for go into in today, unfortunately, but we will look at what some of the external characteristics that a person should have in order to complete his character, in order for him to be healthy in his iman, in his mannerisms, internally and externally. So the author says, Faslun, chapter, وَيَنْبَغِي لِلْإِنسَانِ أَنْ لَا يُدْخَلْ فِي سِرِّ قَوْمِ وَلَا حَدِيثِ لَمْ يُدْخِلُهُ فِيهِ It is not binding, it is against good character that a person involves himself in a conversation which he has been left out in. Meaning, if there is a private conversation between two people, three people, etc. He doesn't insert himself into that conversation. And this is very important in the day of social media. Where a lot of people want to know what is going on. A lot of people are concerned about the news of other people, etc. And it becomes very easy for them to get engaged with things which doesn't concern them. The author is saying here, it is not befitting and it is not good manners. If you have been left out for a particular reason, respect that. And actually part of your iman and your own uh, sense of taqwa, a person should be conscious of the things that he is talking about, the things that he is listening to, the things that he is watching, etc. And the best example is the Prophet Ibn Abi Awfa, noble companion, said in describing the Prophet ﷺ, he said, this is what I saw the character of the Prophet ﷺ. He used to spend a great deal of emphasis on time in making dhikr of Allah. And we've talked about this before in previous sessions, and I'm sure this will keep coming up. The concept of dhikr 
is not that a person constantly just says SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar, reciting the Qur'an, making dua. Those are good aspects of dhikr. But dhikr is anything which helps a person remind Allah or remind himself of Allah, should I say. And that could be internally, that could be externally, that could even be actions where you realize, okay, I need to be doing something which is good. Therefore, you fall into a state of dhikr or being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, yukthir al dhikr, Ibn Abi Ufa, describing the Prophet. Sallam. Number one, wa yuqillil or wa yuqillil lagu. Wa yuqillil lagu. He didn't spend any time and he used to minimize the amount of time that he used to use in conversation which didn't really have any benefit. So the Prophet used to ask about the concerns of the affairs of the people and it's likely that people would have come to him and they would have been talking to him about things which doesn't concern him, which he has no real uh, interest in perhaps, should we say. Uh, it doesn't concern the Messenger of Allah for you to speak to him in this manner. So the Prophet used to uh, not spend much time in entertaining conversations which didn't concern him. He used to extend the amount of time that he used to pray. Now, some of the ulama said, meaning he used to pray long salawat even if the number of units were short. So if it took him one hour to pray two rak'at, that's what we refer to as wa yutil salat. Some of the ulama have said wa yutil salat, meaning he used to engage in a lot of salawat. So now there is a well-known khilaf between the ulama. Is it better for a person to pray a long number of units or is it better for him to pray short bursts of units but pray more of them? So in one hour he can probably pray, I don't know, 100 rak'at, 50 rak'at, 60 rak'at, something like that. Or is it better for him to pray four rak'at very long? Whatever the case, the Prophet used to engage in his spare time in remembering Allah, doing things which are of benefit to him, not engaging in conversations which are of no benefit. And if he was alone himself, he would the salah. Or yuqsir al khutbah. Whenever he needed to speak to people, he was straight to the point. He was concise and he was straight to the point. He didn't go on and on and on and on. He didn't take people's time. He didn't make people feel bored. Or yuqsir al khutbah. وَلَا يَأْنَفْ And he didn't think highly of himself. He didn't think him to be greater than anybody else. And this is a description of another companion who wasn't even related to the Prophet in saying that this is what I observed from him. Imagine what those people would have said or what he would have said had he been related to him and had he lived with him etc. He's saying this is what I saw from him and Constantly, I never saw him thinking that he was better than other people. And he goes on, Yamshi Mal Armala. He used to support and aid and visit uh, the widows. Wal Miskeen and the people who are obviously the people who are less fortunate. He used to be concerned of their affairs and he used to walk with them, meaning aid them. He used to be supportive of their. Uh, affairs, he used to ask about them. الحاجة, and he used to be of assistance to uh, the people who needed his help. This hadith has been narrated in Nasai with Darimi and others. So, this actually explains how the character of a believer should be, especially when the author is saying here that he doesn't engage in those things which are of no benefit. This doesn't mean that the person doesn't interact. This doesn't mean that the person doesn't socialize. But in another hadith, the Prophet gives us a golden principle. Min husni islam al mar From the goodness of a person's islam, tarkuhu ma la yani is to leave whatever does not concern him. So from your character with Allah, your own personality building and your relationship with those people who you uh, who you do meet etc the, the Muslim brothers the Muslim sisters, even probably even the kuffar is that you are conscious of the fact that okay this is private information this is too much information this is information that does not concern me perhaps 
I can engage in a conversation with a person on this matter and perhaps there will be khair in it or there will be some advice for myself or that person. You are conscious to the fact that everything that is being said and everything that you are listening to is going to have an imp impact on who you are. How many times have you met someone and you've had a conversation with them and that conversation was just a normal dunya wee conversation but they've said something and it's had an imprint on you, positive or negative. It's made you think about something positive or negative. How many times I've seen this as well myself, the personal experience with uh, you know, uh, different counselling sessions etc. where a person will say that the brother, his sister said something to him, for example. A family member has said something to the husband. And the husband takes it out on the wife. Or the wife has a friend and she's being treated in a manner by her husband. And she's complaining to the friend. So then the wife takes it out on the husband even though that their relationship is healthy. This is not to say that we are not supposed to socialize, we are not supposed to aid one another, this is not the case, but what we should be conscious of the fact that we have correct etiquettes and manners and we engage in those things where we can be of benefit or we can attain benefit ourselves. If we are not going to get benefit, if there's going to be f further harm or something like that from the character of the Muslim, is as the author is saying here, is that he should not include himself. Do not enter into the private conversations, those affairs which does not concern you. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he goes on and gives an example also. He says, not engaging in things which are of no benefit to you, this includes speaking about, this includes looking, this includes listening. This includes walking towards. This includes thinking about. And all of these are examples of something which could be done by a person which are of no benefit. So he goes on in Qayyim rahimahullah. And keeping away from all of the inward and outward actions that do not concern you. And this is a sentence. Now Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah after explaining the hadith in Husn al-Islam al Tarku mala yani is the goodness of a person's Islam is to leave, which is uh, not something which should concern him. He said, Ibn Qayyim, in explanation, this sentence is sufficient concerning all piety. This sentence is a principle concerning all piety. Rahimahullah. Then the author goes on after talking about not including yourself in private conversations or conversations which are personal to a person's uh, affairs and it doesn't concern you he then goes on to say or address what about if they don't know what about if I can listen and they don't know eavesdropping what is the ruling on that he said it is not permissible for a person to listen to a speech or conversation that is happening between some people or two people and they do not want to concern you in that. And our religion teaches this in actual fact that not only is it bad character and bad manners that you are sitting next to the wall or listening on the other side of the door or you are you know, reading a person's private messages or something like that. Not only is that bad character but it is a major sin. The Prophet said, وَمَنْ اسْتَمَعَ إِلَىٰ حَدِيثٍ قَوْلٌ وَهُمْ لَهُ كَارِهُونَ If he Anybody who eavesdrops on a conversation with a group of people and they dislike it. This is important. They dislike that that person hears it. It's not that people are talking and you're, supposed to, you're in the room. You're not supposed to be listening, but they don't really bother about you being there or not. That's not, the quick, that's not the question here. Eavesdropping is when they know that this is a private conversation. They've shut off the doors. They don't want people to hear it. Yet you still go and try and find out what they're talking about or what they've been texting each other or what they've been emailing each other etc. Oh, if you ruin them in, the Prophet ﷺ said that they know that that person is there and they dislike it or they go on the side and they're talking. If a person continues to eavesdrop after making it clear, after the person has made it clear that they don't want him to be there, subba fi it will be then poured into his ears 
الأنق يوم القيامة molten lead will be poured into that person's ears on the day of judgment it's been narrated by Bukhari now a person will think that's a severe punishment I want to stay away from that but isn't it a bit harsh for the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to give us that detailed description why is Islam so strict why can't we just say well don't do it and there is a punishment behind it why is it that the messenger of Allah has given us such a detail and and vivid description we will learn from this hadith a very important principle when it comes to character building in itself which is that it is not good manners to constantly be lenient and soft so that people will walk over another person without building consequences in the individual himself or other people and when we can understand this principle, we will then understand that the people who uh, implement this principle will be the people of Taqwa. Because that person realizes, okay, look, I don't want to be in that situation. And I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to punish me. But if I was to do that out of my own free will, that is potentially what something could happen. So the fact that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has explained this to us is actually the pinnacle of good manners. And it is not good manners for a person to say, okay, well, that's a bit too descriptive and I don't want to scare people, etc. And I'm just going to leave that out. No, no, it's not good manners for a person not to be sincere towards them to say, listen, this is potentially what something could happen if you were to disobey the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fall into something which is prohibited. Now, bearing in mind, that doesn't mean that we don't make learning age appropriate. That is not something I would tell one of my children, for example, because it is not appropriate to their age. It's appropriate for a mature adult uh, audience. But the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us this very important principle. And we also know from other ahadith, the Prophet ﷺ used to address people according to their level. Eavesdropping is not allowed. What if a person says, I just want to know what they're saying, I just want to listen even though it's a private conversation, I just want to read. What's wrong with that? I don't mean bad. Imam al nawawi rahimahullah, he said, there are two types of eavesdropping. Number one, which is known as tahassus, and another one, which is known as tajassus. And tahassus is spying, even if a person doesn't have a bad intention. It's spying, even if a person doesn't have bad intention. He just wants information about that person. He just wants some dirt on that person. He just wants to know what's going on. That is included in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Anyone who listens to a conversation and they dislike for him uh, to be there and to listen, it will be poured into him or into his ear. Uh, hot, molten lead, may Allah protect us. So Imam al is saying that part of this is tahassus. So a person could say, well, I don't mean bad, I just want to hear. It's not acceptable. And tajassus is spying with a bad intention. Listening so that you can pick up mistakes, so that you can spread those mistakes, so you can rejoice in those mistakes. All of this is not permissible and is not from the manners and the character of the person of taqwa. Last week we looked at how to be wise in the way we speak to each other, the way we greet, the way we enter, the way we ask for permission. Now the author is talking about how we should sit and who we should sit with and what we should listen to whilst we are sitting. So if they don't like it, then respect that decision. It's a private conversation. If there is a conversation that is going on, there is no khair in it, you should change the atmosphere and you should bring about goodness. If there is no goodness, get up and leave. Also what we learn from the etiquettes of sitting, socializing and gathering and the brotherhood that we should have in that, is that people should not feel isolated. A person should not think that, okay, well, everybody else is talking and nobody really wants me here. 
That is not the character of the believer. But at the same time, the believer who is in a group chat or in a personal conversation or uh, in a social gathering where they are physically sitting, they should also be conscious of the fact that these people perhaps don't want me there. For whatever reason. And they should respect that and they should leave on their own accord. So what we are learning from what the author is saying here is that it works both ways. The people that are speaking but also the person that is present who is not speaking but perhaps is listening to what is going on. If they know or if they get an idea that those people who are talking perhaps doesn't want me to be there or something like that, part of etiquette is then for you to excuse yourself so that you can preserve that brotherhood and you can preserve that completion that the believers should have with one another. Then the author moves on to talking about if you have been included in a conversation, what are some of the etiquettes and the protocols there? He then says, Rahimahullah, that people's secrets are an amana. People's secrets are a trust. Woman talaffata fi hadithihi fahuwa kal mustawde li hadithi. If a person is telling you something and he says to you, don't tell anyone. This is between me and you. Talaffata, meaning he looks right and he looks left to see if there's anybody around. He's entrusting you with a piece of information. The author says, يَجِبَ حِبْضُهُ عَلَيْهِ Then it becomes wajib upon him to preserve that secret. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا حَدَّثَ الرَّجُلُ الْحَدِيثِ If a person gives another person some information, ثُمَّ الْتَفَتَ Then he's looking right and left. See if anybody's listening. This is just between me and you, meaning, فَهِيَ amana. Then this becomes a trust upon that person. And included in this is that if you've got information about somebody else, and they don't want anyone to know, then it's not permissible for you to go around giving personal information of other people. Phone numbers, personal incidents, personal experiences, personal situations. That the person, this thing happened in their life. Let me tell you because you're a friend and we're a friend, we're all friends. Let me just tell you what's happened. No, don't do that. It's not allowed. Information that you have, which is of a sensitive nature, you are not allowed to share it. Even if it's itching you, do not do that. Even if you think that the person, they won't mind, don't do that. This is between you and them. And that's it. Even if there are other people uh, that you trust, that are close to you, etc. This is still between you and them. Leave it at that. Because part of your Muslim character is to preserve the welfare and the identity and the things which are concerning this Muslim. Part of preserving uh, their reputation is not to disclose information about them. We're just talking about perhaps permissible information. Perhaps, you know, somebody could uh, find out information about this person and you would think, okay, maybe they can help them or make the out for them. Still don't do that. Because this is an amana that you have been given about this person. Ask for permission, and then maybe you can have a conversation with somebody else. But if this is private information that the person has uh, given to you and said, listen, don't tell anyone, this is between me and you, then it's not permissible for you to speak to anyone else about that. And even if they have not given that information to you in secret, you know this about them, still part of the character of a Muslim is that they preserve uh, you know, the things that are happening in the life of another Muslim. Perhaps they don't want anyone else to know. This is slightly different to ghiba because ghiba, dhikru, akhaqi ma is to mention something that 
your brother dislikes. So now, if there is a sin about your brother, or if there is a bad trait about your brother, and then you go around talking about uh, that trait about your brother so that you can degrade his honor, you can diminish his, respond, uh, his, re his reputation, etc. That is clearly, even as a major sin in itself. But here we're talking about things which are permissible. This person applied for a job, they didn't get the job. So let me go and tell another person. This is just permissible, it's just everyday talk perhaps, but part of your character is that you have to realize that if you were to tell other people that this person didn't get the job, well, how is this person going to feel? They might not like it. And before we move on to the next session, or the next paragraph, it is important for us to also know that some of the Salaf used to consider a person who used to disclose the secrets and not protect the welfare of another individual. They used to see that person as a fasiq, as a fajir, as a person who is an open, clear sinner doing major sin. Some of the Salaf used to have that as a view of a person who goes around talking about other people. Why? Because he himself has not completed his character. So now what we have learned so far from what the author is saying surrounding brotherhood and sisterhood when it comes to the way that we interact with one another. Number one, respect people's personal space. Respect people's personal conversations. Don't get engaged in things which are not of benefit to you. Don't get engaged uh, with uh, things where you realize that you have got no concern in. It doesn't really benefit you. And perhaps they don't even want you to be part of that group or conversation. So excuse yourself from it. This is all from good character. But at the same time, it is upon us to ask about other people if they are in the same group or social gathering, etc. Uh, ask about them. Don't just let them sit there alone having no one to talk to, having no one to ask about them, etc. Ask about them, see if they're okay, see what's going on in their lives. This is part of good Islamic character. But also, is that if you have got into a conversation with someone, you preserve the thing that they are saying. You preserve their identities. And you only mention of that which is going to be good, and that which is not going to bring about any harm for yourself or for other people. Then the author moves on, he says, Faslun, wa yukrah al khuyala wa zahu fil mashi. It is disliked, meaning it is haram, for a person to be arrogant and to show you know, a boastful nature whilst he is walking. Wa innama yamshi qasda, and that he should walk in a balanced, humble manner. فَإِنَّ الْخُيَرَةِ Because surely showing arrogance uh, whilst he is walking فَإِنَّ الْخُيَرَةِ خُيَرَةَ مِشْيَةٌ يُبْغِضُهَ اللَّهِ It is something which is uh, disliked to Allah to the extent that Allah becomes angry with a person who shows arrogance. إِلَّا دَيْنَ الصَّفَّيْنِ He said the only exception is when a person needs to walk in that manner in a boastful manner, in a proud manner with his chest out and he's walking with arrogance etc uh, when the two armies about to meet so that there is no sense of humility and humbleness come on you can walk over us no you stand up for yourself when you need to stand up for yourself that is fine then you can you know, remain firm and show that you are resolute however the normal state of a Muslim is to walk in a balanced manner not showing pride, not showing arrogance, not dipping while he's walking, not walking sideways, not taking up the whole pavement, not uh, invading personal space for other people. And this is precisely the advice that we find in the Qur'an for Luqman to his son. He says, Rahimahullah, who wasn't a prophet, he was a very noble man, وَلَا تُسَعِرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ Do not give people your cheek. Meaning, I'm not going to look at you, I'm going to look at you from the side, I'm going to look down at you. Don't be proud in the way that you address people, the way you meet with people. What's the opposite then? Show humility, show a nice face, smile, show concern. 
And do not walk on the earth with arrogance. And we learn also from the Sunnah that the Prophet used to walk in a humble manner as if he was walking downhill, down a slope. How would you walk? How, what happens to your body? It naturally shows uh, a downward posture, I mean, uh, a posture of humility. But also we learn from the Sunnah that not only did he walk in that manner, but he also wa- walked with purpose. He didn't walk that way. Oh, where am I going? Let me go this way now. Where am I going? As in, he didn't wander around. So he used to walk from one place to another. He used to walk with purpose. And also included in the statement here, Yamshi Qasdan, that you walk with, uh, you know, uh, in a balanced manner, is that you walk without being distracted. Don't look right, don't look left. If there is no need for you to look around, don't look around because you might not see you might see something that you shouldn't be looking at. A person might say, Why does he keep walking and looking around in that manner? The way your body language is, even once you are walking, tells other people, more importantly tells yourself and and the connection that you have with Allah if you have the class in it, but it tells also other people what kind of a character that person is. If he's walking with a dip, looking around, looking at other people's houses, looking at other people's uh, cars, or looking at what people have got, etc. I mean, that is not etiquette. That is not correct, correct manner for the believer. You walk with a balanced manner, with a good posture, looking down, uh, being humble towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't look around more than what is necessary. And some of the ulama have said that the more that the eye looks, the more the heart will become distracted. The more the heart will have desires inserted. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, in nadra, sahmatun min sihami iblis. Your eyes, the things that you look at, is like an arrow from the arrows of iblis. When you look at it, something enters into your heart. The advice goes on in the Quran. Inna Allah la yuhibbu kulla mukhtani fakhur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like, meaning Allah is angered with, as the author has said, all of those who show khuyara, mukhtarun, arrogance, fakhur, boastful in his nature. The answer, the, the answer and the way that we should be goes on. Waqsid fi mashik, be balanced in the way that you walk. Waqdud min sawtik, lower your voice, don't raise your voice. The believer has no reason ever to raise his voice, except if he's to make an announcement or to address a group of Normally, the way he should be is balanced in the way he walks, humble in the way he walks, humble in the things that he looks at, and humble in his voice. Inna ankar al aswad ila sawtul hamil. Verily, the most disliked sounds is the braying of a donkey. Imam al to be. In explaining what this means, the braying of a donkey, what does that mean? He said, Hadhi al ayah, or these group of ayat, adabun min Allah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us correct character and etiquette. And this is befitting, because this is the topic that we are discussing. Biturk is siyah, fi wujuhin nas, tahawanun bihim, o biturk is siyah jumlad. Do not shout at people, do not raise your voice at people in order to belittle them, to bully them, to look down on them. Oh, be turkisiyah jumla, meaning he shouldn't do this at all anyway. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ankara aswat al hamir, the most disliked sound is the braying of a donkey, Imam al Qurtib is saying, all of these ayat are actually teaching us. The adab of a believer. And he should be leaving them, whether he is showing arrogance towards another person or not. But especially if there are other people involved. So when you are walking, don't walk with arrogance. When you are discussing and, uh, and looking at people and turning your face towards things, don't do it in an arrogant, boastful manner. Do it in a manner, like we said before in the very introduction, that from adab is... كَفْنْ أَذَا وَبَذْلُ النَّدَى وَصَبْرُ الْأَذَى وَوَجْهُ الطَّلِقِ 
four aspects of good manners. And all four of these must be instilled even when he is addressing. Even if it's just his body language, even if he's walking or doing a, a normal, regular action, this is something that we must build in ourselves as part of our character. Not to harm one another, to spread goodness if there is an opportunity to do so. If something bad happens, don't act or react in a harsh and uh, a disliked manner. Show some sabr, show some control, and do all of this with a nice face. So here the author is saying, here, don't show any arrogance. Now this is important because it's very unfortunate now that, you know, the younger generation, and it's not just specific to them, that when something good happens, or when something bad happens, they tend to raise their voice. And character and mannerisms sometimes become uh, compromised. And this is why, as you will see in our religion, wailing is haram, shouting is haram when you are afflicted with death. Wailing is haram. Niyaha. This is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the reasons why the ulama have said wailing is haram is because not only does it show discontent of the qadr of Allah, etc. and it's against making dua, etc. but also screaming and shouting is prohibited. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like this kind of behavior from the believers. But also in the time of joy. Now you might even find some practicing brothers and sisters behaving in a manner which is perhaps not appropriate for the Muslim. They will start perhaps dancing even if there's no music around. They will start jumping. They will start uh, shouting, you know, uh, high fives and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, The Prophet ﷺ, when he used to be happy, some of the companions have said that we would recognize the happiness and the joy on the face of the Prophet ﷺ with a smile. Never did he laugh with an audible sound. He used to smile until his teeth used to become visible and that's it. That's how he was, ﷺ. Therefore, when you are happy, when you are sad, when you are walking, when you are discussing, when you... Your body language in general should be one which reflects piety. And piety is humility. And humility is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you are happy, when you are sad, when you are walking, the way you sit, the way you talk, all of these things should be reflective. And when something good happened, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? Did he start jumping and shouting and, you know, yelling at his friends, whether it's in a good way or bad way? No, he used to make sujood. This is not to say that a person shouldn't have his own cultural way of showing happiness and sadness. This is not the point. The point that we're making here is that a person should have inside of himself humility. This should be something which should be ingrained. And it should be something that he's working on. That whenever goodness or sadness comes, his immediate attention is what? is Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he can show humility in that time of sadness or joy and make it reflect on his body. The author says that we are not allowed to walk with arrogance wa yukrah al khuyara wa zahu fil mashi fa innu khuyara mashiatu yubghidu Allah ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angered with it but the question now is what is pride and what is arrogance? These need to be defined in order for us to stay away from it. The ulama have said that there are three aspects to arrogance. Number one, khuyala, and that is the worst one, where a person thinks himself to be better than other people and thinks himself that he deserves all praise. And perhaps that form of khuyara will also then mean that he doesn't feel that he needs to worship Allah anymore. And it could even be, as we have seen with Iblis and Fir'aun and others as examples, that they reached a level of arrogance where not only did they say, I don't need to worship Allah, but they 
themselves saw themselves as a replacement. Khuyara is where a person thinks himself to be better than others and that all praise belongs to him. That's number one. That's arrogance, number one. Another type of khuyara, or another type of arrogance, should I say, is fakhr. Fakhr. And fakhr, again, I mean, maybe there's a better word for it in the English language, but again, it's similar to arrogance, fakhr, when a person is proud, let's say. And he wants to be praised for certain traits that he's got. He's proud and he's boastful about those things. But he's not on the level of arrogance where a person is constantly arrogant. Arrogant about everything. His clothes, his food, his, his, his car, his house, his job, everything. Everything he's just arrogant about. I'm better than everybody else, etc. May Allah protect us. And that he feels that he doesn't need anyone and everyone needs him. That's the level of khuyara. Fakhr is where a person has arrogance but it's limited to certain scenarios and certain things. Ajab is another form of arrogance where a person is amazed by himself. And this is due to some knowledge or some skills that he feels that he has which are better than other people. All of these are a form of kibr where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يدخل الجنة أهد في قلبه مثقال حبة خردل من كبرية No one will enter into Jannah even if he's got a small amount of pride in his heart. So we've got arrogance, we've got pride, and we've got self-amazement. May Allah protect us. All of this has been made haram in the religion, and this is what the author is saying. But why? Some of the evil consequences of arrogance and pride, because we started late, unfortunately, we won't be able to go through all of them. But it's sufficient for us to say two things. Number one, it is a form of najasa in the heart. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said that arrogance is a najasa. So how will the heart will ever be purified whilst that najasa is there? Hence the Prophet Sallallahu said, if a person even has a little bit of it, may Allah protect us, he will never enter into Jannah. Number two, it is the way of destruction and it is the way of the people of the hellfire. Allah says, أَلَيْسَ فِي جَهَنَّمَ مَثْوًا لِلْ Isn't the hellfire a befitting end place for the people of Kibr. May Allah protect us and give us steadfastness. What's the solution? The solution is what the author has said previously. The way that you are, the way that your character is, your personality should be of one which is humble with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're humble with Allah, you will spread goodness towards other people. And if a person is not humble with Allah, this will create a hard heart. A hard heart which doesn't have mercy, a hard heart which doesn't have humility, a hard heart which doesn't have gentleness. And then it will be replaced. The harder the heart it becomes, it becomes harder because of pride and arrogance and harshness. Therefore, a person needs to go back to Iman and go back to his connection with Allah to make it softer look where he is with Allah look where he wants to go in the Akhirah look how insignificant you are that will then have an impact on the way that you are in your gatherings in the way that you are in your body language the way that you are when you interact with yourself with your Lord and other members of the creation after talking about how we should interact with one another and part of that is covering the mistakes of one another and when we realize that we should be covering the mistakes of one another, we realize that we all have own, we all have our own mistakes and faults. The author then goes on to talk about the biological mistakes and coverings of one another. 
So when he is saying, this is the way that you should walk, this is the way that you should socialize, this is the way that you should talk to people, if you realize that there's a private conversation going on, then you know, seclude yourself from that, excuse yourself from that, push yourself away, etc. All of this is in order for us to preserve the reputation and the brotherhood. These are actions that we can do. Now he goes on to talking about biological forms of mistakes and coverings that we should be doing for our brother and our sister. He says, Faslun, from the chapters of this book, Wamin Makarim al from the noble character of the believer, at to ignore. And the whole Musawi and Nas were my ever do fear of Allah to him in Kashiraura. O Kurujri and Hasot. O Rih. And he gives examples of a way that a person can cover the biological mistakes of his brother or his sister. He's saying that from good manners is that you are to that you, you don't pay attention to it, you ignore it, you turn a blind eye to some of the things that come out of him or her biologically which are disliked such as something from the aura or something which is not pleasant to look at but you don't pick at it, you don't uh, make a point of saying look look at you, look how horrible you look or something or the way they smell or the things that come out of their body from the sounds he is saying here that it's from good manners that you are towards with your brother and sister is that you cover their mistakes. But wallahi, my brothers and sisters, I've seen some ulama and students of knowledge that when they meet each other, they correct each other's jackets and they correct each other's shamag and they correct each other's beard. Okay, now you look nice. And the one, he does it back to them. And then they, they, uh, they share perfume. And they share bukhur. And they talk about the latest perfume that they think is good. They, I think you should buy this one. I think this one will suit you. Or this is how you should do bukhur, buy bukhur from this place so that you can smell nice. Well, I, I've seen this with my own eyes. I've seen one student of knowledge uh, with a sheikh. He had uh, the, sh- the student of knowledge had some stuff on his jacket. The sheikh spent, before speaking to him, started brushing off his, uh, his jacket, etc. Put it straight and then said, okay, now let's talk. This is what the author is saying here. From good manners is that we cover and we rectify the biological mistakes that we have in ourselves. Why? Because the believer recognizes that he himself is deficient. This is the ayah that we started with and this is precisely what Ibn Abbas said. And that is really an introduction which summarizes everything. We're giving examples of that ayah and that explanation from our Imam Shaykh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz they complete one another, they perfect one another, they remove those things which uh, create deficiencies in one another and they want completion for one another. And he gives examples here of the way they look, the, the sounds that come out of them, the smells that come out of them. And in actual fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even describes the people of Lut alayhi salam and this has been mentioned by some of the ulama of tafsir. In describing the people of Lut, we know what they did, men with men, etc., and they stopped getting married, and they and they spread zina, and they used to be highway robbers, and they used to uh, kidnap people and things like that. This was the 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 qawm of Lut. One of the things that comes, Allah says, And in your gatherings, you do the munkar. Now, some of the ulama say munkar meaning in your gatherings you do zina, and in your gatherings you do certain things. From the ulama, this has been mentioned by Shokani and others from the Salaf from before him, Waqil, it's been said that in their gatherings, Kanu yal'abuna bil hammam. That they used to go and they used to play in the bathroom. And it's been said that they used to laugh at each other's sounds and they used to laugh at each other's mistakes. Or one would pass wind and then they would laugh at each other and things like that. And it was also part of Arab culture that when a person used to pass wind, they used to laugh at each other. And this happened in the presence of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu And he said, لِمَا يَدْحَكْ أَحَدُكُمْ مِمَّا يَفْعَلْ You're going to laugh at another person when he does it himself. Therefore, the author, what he is saying here, 
is that a person must realize that he has got mistakes and that we must have a sense of tawafun, you know, overlooking and overseeing and ignoring and if you are in a position to advise and stop and bring about goodness for your brother then do so that is part of good character and mannerisms so he gives examples of the way that a person looks the sounds he gives examples of a person when he is sleeping and you know, noises coming out of him, snoring, etc. And he's giving different examples here. And whatever the case, what we understand here is that from your good manners is that you try and preserve the reputation of your brother. And this is everything that we've been discussing so far in the things that you hear about them, the way that you walk towards them, the way that you walk past them the way that you look towards them, but also part of all of this, is that you do not want to reduce their shyness. You do not want to make them feel embarrassed, which will then lessen the estimation that people have towards them. These are some of the things that he's mentioned when he talks about brotherhood and gatherings, etc. There was more that was prepared, unfortunately. We had some technical difficulties, so... We ended up starting late, so unfortunately the presentation has been reduced. But now the author moves on to talking about uh, personal hygiene and the way that you appear. He says, Faslun, from the chapters of manners. Wa ashratun min al fitra. There are ten things which are from the fitra. Five are in your head and five are in your body. What about the five in your head? He says, Madmada. To gargle. Wa istinshaq. To clean out your nose. Wa siwak. And what is correct is that siwa refers to all forms of dental hygiene. It doesn't have to be in the stick. If it is with the toothpick, the, you know, the well-known miswak toothpick, then that is sufficient, that is good. But anything which is going to make your mouth smell nice, look nice, and nothing bad is emitted from it, that is included, inshallah, with the ajar of siwa. وَقَصُ sharib To trim your moustache so that it doesn't fall over your mouth. So that it doesn't look, you know, uh, bushy and you know, overwhelming your facial features, etc. What it found here. These are the five from the fitrah to let your beard grow for the men. And it could also be said, as been mentioned by some of the ulama, is for a woman to remove facial hair. So she's got moustache growing, or she's got hair on her cheeks and her chin, etc. To remove that. That is part of, as we mentioned by some of the ulama, as part of the fitrah. What is the fitrah? Imam al-Shawqani says in Nail al-Tar, uh, this is probably one of the best ways of uh, looking at what the fitrah is, is to preserve the natural pattern as to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a person on internally and externally. So some people will pay attention to fitrah externally. I want to, you know, remove my hairs, I want to remove my nails, I want to look nice, etc. And I want to feel nice about myself. But Imam al-Shawqani, rahimahullah, is saying part of the fitrah is the tawheed and the purity and the cleanliness that Allah has created you from within. The innocence and the sincerity. But here the author is talking about the appearance and the hygiene. So he's saying ten are from the fitrah. So he's mentioned the five in the head. And now he says the five in the body. Now the five in the body, uh, removing your private hairs, pubic hairs to pluck the armpit hairs, to cut the nails, to make istinja, to wash off any kind of najasa that you have on you, any kind of impurities, urine, feces, blood, or anything that comes from the private parts, it should be washed off, so that there's no smell, there's no you know, spread of najasa, no spread of impurities. Wal khitan, and he also says, from the fitrah on your body, is that you are circumcised. Now, the majority of the ulama have said all of these are sunnah. All of these are sunnah. And there is difference of opinion between the different madhahib as to some of them being wajib. So, for example, some of them will say that circumcision is wajib. Some of them will say uh, growing the beard is wajib, etc. Whatever the case, these are the things that a person must do in order for him to have good manners and good character, irrespective of whether it's sunnah or not. Because the Prophet said, At-Tuhur Shatrul Imani. Your cleanliness, internally and externally, but here we're talking about the focus is on the external, is half of your Iman. Therefore, it's not part of manners. 
or it's not part of Iman where you are not showing good character and you are not presentable and the idea here is that not only do we not want to be bad in ourselves or be bad to look at but that like we said about body language and the way you walk and all of these things that we've said before all of these have a reflection on your taqwa so that you don't look bad because you're a person of taqwa you don't smell bad because you're a person of taqwa you're constantly uh, paying attention to your appearance because you're a person of taqwa that's what a person of taqwa looks like that's what a person of taqwa smells like that's what a person of taqwa knows what the sharia asks from him in the way that he is in his body but also in the way that he looks a person of taqwa is a person who makes an effort the last thing that we will do today inshallah because of time again like I said uh, please accept my apologies we've been very rushed but the last thing we're going to look at here are what the author talks about when it comes to your hairstyles so an extension of what he has mentioned about fitra here he's going to talk about hairstyles so he says faslun the next chapter wa yukrah natfu shayb and it is disliked for a person to take out and to pull out white hairs faqad warada fil hadith annahu nurullah it's been narrated in the hadith that this is from the light of allah but this is not correct as uh, the muhaqqiq said himself and others from the ulama is that the hadith of the white hairs is not from the nur of Allah, but it's from the nur of Iman. It is from the nur of Iman. وَهُوَ أَيْدًا نَذِيرُ الْمَوْتِ White hairs is a warner that death is close. So the author is saying here that whenever you see white hair, you take that as an admin, admonition against yourself you take that as an admonition to yourself don't start thinking okay the while the whiteness i've got on my face the whiteness i've got on my hair that is a aib that is a fault no what he is saying here don't get rid of it because allah has sent it to you because it is a warning however there are certain things that you can do to preserve your character so that you can still take the warning but still appear in a nice way so it's recommended as the author is saying here that a person uh, dyes his hair but the majority of the ulama have said that he should avoid black they've said it's makroo but the correct opinion from the maliki so from the shafi'i madhab is that it is haram and this is the opinion of many of the contemporaries And what we can also mention with what the author is saying here, وَحَاثُوا عَلَىٰ حُسْنِ الْعَمَلْ وَوَقَارْ وَيُخْرَحْ حَلْقُ الْكَفَاءِ إِلَّا لِمَنْ أَرَادَ الْحِجَامَ Now he is talking about the way that your hair should look. So he's saying that a person should make an effort and make himself look good and he should have some humility in that. But it is disliked for a person to shave part of the hair or shorten part of the hair, as some of the ulama have included, and leave other parts of the hair. Everything should be balanced, everything should be uh, in a presentable manner. The last thing that we can mention when it comes to hairstyles, the majority of the ulama have said that hairstyles are up to customs, but this is based on conditions. So the way that you do your hair, etc., all of it is permissible, except if it goes against three conditions. Number one, there is no imitation of immoral people. When a person looks at it and they think, okay, that's not a good person. It cannot change the creation of Allah. And like we have mentioned before, it must be all at one length. Some of the ulama have said if you do it on the sides and you shave it on the sides, that's fine. But generally on your head, it should be all balanced. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq and to grant us success and he makes us the people of iman and character in the dunya and the akhirah. Hada wallahu a'lam. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.